So what's the point of this analysis? Um, what's the value to the bank? Well, it's hopefully to mitigate risk. If they could predict housing prices, uh, they would get a better indication of the risk they're taking on by when they're issuing a mortgage. So they don't want to issue a mortgage, let's say a house is a million dollars, or at least they think it's worth a million dollars, and they issue the mortgage, 800000 and it turns out the house is only worth 600000 So all of a sudden, they're underwater. So that's kind of one of the reasons why this would be a great model for them. <clears throat> and then it would give them a better indication, you know, how their portfolio is, of their loans that they've made. Uh, one of the issues is prediction. Are we actually predicting prices? Because with our analysis, we have the, the fortune of having hindsight. Or hindsight? Yeah. So we're using um, indicators that aren't available. Um, like, for instance, GDP. The GDP numbers don't come out for another you know, 90 days after. So it's kind of tough to say that you could use that as a prediction. So I think we're more estimating prices than actually predicting prices. So I don't know if based on this analysis where actually they could actually use it to predict housing prices. But anyway, so the data <coughs> where Moscow, I think it has about a dozen different districts and we're fortunate enough to be able to match up the sub areas to each of the districts. Um, this is just showing housing prices. Everybody's seen this before. <coughs> when log transformation, the 1 million outliers, I ended up just taking them out straight up in a. This price of square meter, um, this isn't really a great chart for a time series, but it still just shows you the distribution of price per square meter. Um, it does kind of look normal, normally distributed, but that doesn't mean much because it encompasses different areas that have different um, price per square meters. So this is kind of the observations by district. You see that we have a lot, and uh, I'm gonna call it Novo. Um, and <laughs> both in the train and the test, Novo sticks out. Um, <clears throat> and it's funny, Novo is actually one of the lower priced uh, districts. Novo and Tryotsky, those are the, they're kind of outside of main Moscow, and they, they bring down, if you just look at the median prices, uh, those kind of weigh down, as you can tell over there. Okay, uh, another thing, just missing data. Novo has the majority of the missing data. If you look at this, they're both on the same scale. This is all missing data, and this is just Novo. So you can see that most of the missing data is in that one area. You'll see later on that there's another reason that kind of helps explain. <clears throat> all right, missing this in Novo. Again, this just shows that it's still, this is all districts and this is Novo. These are the more important, like Life Square. Um, it's just bad data in the Novo area. One of the reasons I found is that Novo is more owner occupied than um, the rest of the areas. So most of the transactions are the owner occupier versus investment. And the investments, it's not a very hot spot, like less than what, 3%. So if you notice in a lot of the data, you have ones for number of rooms, you have ones for kitchen square feet or square meters, and they're heavily dependent on owner occupier. And I think that the data for owner occupier just isn't there. They didn't record it. Uh, they're just not as stringent or whatever. Another interesting thing is that Novo Mosque wasn't incorporated as a district. That was a good one. Uh, it wasn't incorporated as a district till 2012. So maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know. Uh, you know what? State. State would have been a great variable to have because it says the how good the apartment is. But it turns out it's only good for investment. So investments, you can see the distribution of uh, the different classes of state. But when you look at just the owner occupied, heavily ones, does that say that all of the owner occupied places just aren't as good? I don't think so. I think the data just is bad. 
So it kind of just throws out um, the state variable for the owner occupied. So, so that's just one of the issues. So a lot of the inconsistencies come back to this fundamental thing is that owner occupied, the data just isn't there. So as everybody knows that this is our training data and this is our test data. You see right after, well leading up right to the end of our train data, oil prices drop and so does housing prices. I scoured the internet for this. This is the uh, average or median square meter price of uh, Moscow part residentials. <clears throat> yeah, it was, took a little bit. I was gonna use this as a way to adjust prices and then Chow told me that you couldn't use it because it's fundamental to the answer. It's against Kaggle rules, so I didn't go with it. Uh, this is the prices by subregion. Um, you can see how Central is right around uh, the Kremlin. It's downtown. Those are the most expensive. Uh, you down here you have Zenil something, the one that begins with the Z. Uh, it's the cheapest, and then outside. Uh, consists of Novo and Trioski, and they're both at the low end. I wanted to use this too. If I had just predicted on the test data with just the price per square meter at this time, I scored like a 0.48 on Kaggle with nothing else. I don't know if that's good or bad, but just something. Okay, so looking at housing prices compared to oil, like there's, this is, these are both indexed at one at the start of our uh, of our training data. And you can see oil drops and then the housing prices drop. Uh, if you just looked at the median housing price of our training data, you'll see that it drops right here in 2012. But that's largely because there's a spike in the Novo transactions. So the housing prices didn't drop, it was just uh, the composition of our training data. That's why this one looks different. Uh, it's just, you see it drops again because Novo jumps back up. All right, so feature engineering and insights. I had this idea that um, maybe there's, I could get neighborhoods. So I looked at the number of unique observations and I saw a bunch that uh, had 12,000. And it turns out all these have the same um, number of observations and they're all in the same sub area. So to me, it makes it, makes it seem like I can group them by um, neighborhoods. And but look, if it's 12,000, turned out to be 12,000 as well, of the observations are in these neighborhoods of five or more. So this is more of a, a localized, a, a way you can do KNN. This is what I did for KNN on some of the missing variables. I tried to get all the data based off of, or the best was whatever the neighborhood said. Um, what led me to find this is that I was looking at the columns that had floor greater than max floor. And I was looking at the, the Kremlin distance. And so I searched and I was like, oh, well, there's a bunch of 17 max floors in the, um, in the Kremlin neighborhood group. And ours was 17 floor and uh, the max floor is like five. So I was like, huh, that's kind of odd. So anyway, so I think these are neighborhoods. And if I had more time, I would drill down upon that. Uh, feature engineering looked at uh, kitchen size compared to life. Um, this is the unclean data. There's a lot. Again, these are one, um, it said that the kitchen size was the size of the entire house. Didn't make any sense. Um, so I NA that put it as, or imputed as the, the median, which was like about 0.3 or so. This is the unadjusted, or that's the, the clean version. All right, um, life to full. Again, you see the some of the wrong data. Um, they said, we're maybe not wrong, we just don't know that if life, whenever life equals full, is that wrong or is it just means the apartment is the entire size of usable space? So I looked at that variable and I also looked at floor to max floor, you know, find out how high they are 
in the building. Uh, it turns out none of those are really that useful in predicting or as a feature. Um, we used XGBoost to find the most important features. It cut its off here, but we used the top 40, I think, for, um, from this. So KISS, this is keep it simple, stupid. So I wanted to look at the most simplest uh, model we could think of. I did a two-variable multilinear regression. Um, just using full square meters and the sub-area. I don't know if that still counts as two, but since I dummified it. Um, anyway, the R squared was 0.57, and whenever I submitted to Kaggle, I got a 0.38. I think with just two variables, that's not bad. Then we added some more variables. R squared didn't improve much, but our, um, our Kaggle score did. We got, ended up getting a 0.34 or 6 off of, I think, seven variables. And then I'm going to pass it over to Grant the Plumber. Yay. Hello? Okay. So, uh, yeah, Grant the Plumbers, because I'm going to talk about pipelining a little bit. So who here did... <laughs> <laughs> so who here who here worked in who here worked in Python? Python. Who did multiple linear regression in Python? So you need to apply a pipeline if you're going to use kind of any multiple linear regression or singular uh, uh, the support vector machines because you need to scale your data, uh, especially if you're going to use a lot of different variables that have different ranges. So what I'm going to talk about is information leakage. Now, if you have information leakage, that's bad. If you have personal leakage, see a doctor. <laughs> that was my joke. <laughs> so this is an example of improper processing. <laughs> so right here on the top, you'll see for cross-validation what's happening, and on the bottom, this is for set predictions. So this is an example of improper um, processing. So what you do is you typically split your data into a training and test set. You throw your test set away, you leave it alone, you're not going to use it until you predict. Uh, however, what you're going to do is you're going to split up your training da data into training and validation folds. However, if you scale your data first on the entire training set, you're input, putting in information into this scaler into the valid, from the validation fold, which is your test set for cross-validation, then using the, like for example, support vector classifier fit on the training folds and then predicting here. This is using your cross-validation. And then you go through your test set prediction and you're going to do a scalar fit on your training data, and then you have your support vector classifier fit and uh, support vector predict. So this is bad. This is an example of proper processing. You no longer have the validation fold used in your scaling. Okay, so you have information leakage, which is vital and important because you can start to get see correlations that are not really true or in existence. So I did a quick example of this using Python, so bear with me. There's a lot of code here, so I'm going to slow it down. So <laughs> what you can see here is we've scaled our data. We scale our data according to the training, training set. We transform both the test and the training data accordingly. And then we do a grid search over different alpha or lambda parameters using ridge regression. And we're searching over the different parameter grids doing uh, cross-validation folds of five. And you can see here, here's the best parameters. Uh, you get an alpha of 1. Uh, and you can see here's the R squared on the training and test set. Actually, not too bad. Or is it? Because what's, I used about, I think, 12 features in this. And none of them actually showed any linear behavior. So I did this on purpose. I didn't want any of the features to have any linear behavior. But I'm seeing for multiple linear regression or ridge regression a positive correlation. You, yeah, that's bad. So here's the example of using it with proper uh, pipelining. So you need to use the make pipeline package from sklearn pipeline, which will apply the standard scalar ridge and uh, then apply the parameter grid to it. And it no longer takes in the, the validation fold into your data. And what you can see here is we get the same best parameters, which is not always the case. When I first did it, I did like 40 features and the, the, those parameters actually do change. And you can see, no longer do I have any kind of correlation. The linear model does not fit the data, which is what I expected. So does that make sense? Any, good, good. 
Minus two? Yes, you can actually have a negative R squared score. Look it up on sklearn. Just means your, your model's bad. <laughs> so because of that, we, we went away from uh, multiple linear regression and moved on to tree-based models because we thought, you know, that makes sense. So we went, through <laughs> we went through the most simplest one, and that is decision trees. So simple decision trees are known to overfit if you unrestrain it. So what we did was we first just looked at the accuracy of an unrestrained decision tree on the training sets 100% which is what you expect, unrestrained. And then the test is 22% on the R squared. So that's an example of an unrestrained overfit. Uh, so then we did grid search CV. And the advantage of decision trees is you don't have to scale your data. So that pipelining no longer becomes an issue. Um, and so we did a parameter search. These are the top three models, all, all given around the same R squared val validation score. Uh, plug that in, and then the accuracy is on the training set 62% and the accuracy on the test set is 56%. So we're no longer overfitting our decision tree. It's kind of cool. I'm going to go run over. I got two more slides. Okay. So uh, then we did uh, went on to random forest, which is known to uh, less overfit. Again, using the same parameters as our decision tree, uh, we did a random forest unrestrained, just putting it in default parameters. I think it's 10 estimators, 10 trees that it does. Uh, and then we see an unrestrained random force, so it too can also overfit. Uh, we then put it into the grid search CV, and what you can see here on the x-axis is the number of trees that we use in the random forest as a function of the max features, and you can see the R squareds accordingly. So our best one was a, uh, the number of trees was 700, so not the maximum, and with 11 maximum features, so it can choose up to max 11 features in the random forest. And then that gives us a much less overfit of the random forest. However, this is computationally expensive to do this type of grid search. It took eight hours to run with three of my cores processing. So, yeah, that's why you need some big data. Uh, so, time to get boosted. Uh, <laughs> XG boost. Okay, well, this is, the, this is what everybody does. It's a big black box that we really didn't try to solve. Uh, but, you know, underneath that is going to be a nice diamond. So, uh, <laughs> so we did the top 43 features. Uh, we removed time because it was worse on our Kegel score. Uh, we used price per square foot as a predictor. Uh, it's fast. It's nice for Kegel. However, it's not very interpretable. So, you know, it is what it is. And we got a score of 31.3. One, two, nine, yeah, point three two, close. Uh, Questions? Shoot. How can R squared be negative? So there's different definitions of R squared. I, I, What's your R squared? He, he had the same one. Because I, I, I questioned him on it, and he sent me over it from SK Learn. He said R squared can be negative if it. So if you use, I don't know, like a linear model to do, this is, I don't really understand it, but if you do like maybe like a linear model to predict a. Non-linear. I don't know. <laughs> it says it in SK learn that it can Jerry, be negative. Can you explain the can R squared ever be negative? Can R squared ever be R negative? squared negative? Or an imaginary number. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Check out the SK learn documentation and you'll find that it can. It just means your model is. It, it means you yeah. Yeah. So. The, Different definitions of R squared. I didn't know those until I looked it up on Wikipedia. That it's not just one. Yeah. Formula for R squared. So there's just some homework. There's just some homework and learn about learn about information yeah. leakage. Look it up. You don't want that. Yeah. My main point, yeah. So you need to scale your data accordingly based upon, you can do min or max, you can do standard, uh, like, you know, minus the mean divided by the standard deviation on all, just to get them all on the same scale. But the order in which you do that is important. You can't just scale all of your training data accordingly. You have to do it within the cross-validation. 
Otherwise, if you're splitting your data up into different folds, you don't want the validation fold to be included in your scale. Just as we don't transform our test data based upon the test data. Does that make sense? It's like you have to, there's this code here. So you want to do your fit, you scale or fit to the training data, and then you transform both the training and test data according to this fit. So you wouldn't do a scalar.fit test, right? Otherwise, you're changing the shape. You're changing the shape of your data. Yeah. Yeah. This right here? It's the R, I mean, it's the R squared. I, I should say R squared, not accuracy. Sorry. My bad. That should be either one minus, but this is the R squared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My apologies. From XGBoost. Yep. Chicken and the egg, yeah, I know. We <laughs> um, yep. it, it was an iterative process. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I put uh, the, when I started doing the tree based models, I used the clean data I was given for my group uh, and put in the top 20 features. And then for that, I was like, I was satisfied for the rent decision trees and random forest. And then I went and looked into XGBoost and just started adding more and more features and saw the score get better and better. And so, you know, it wasn't data science driven, but it was Kegel driven. <laughs> so, but our main goal was to truly understand the process of like, of machine learning and how to implement it uh, and, you know, KISS, keeping it, keeping it simple. Um, so what I did here is I didn't even touch the test data set from the later years. I did a test training split on the training data. Oh. Yeah, on the training data and called that new test my test data. So I never even touched the test data. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, and the whole purpose was of this part was not to do well on Kaggle, but to demonstrate the principle behind information leakage. Because, yeah. Right, and we're, I mean, this is what we're trying to indicate is like when you do cross validation, you're only fitting on the training folds and not the validation fold. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, finally, 
So that's why the pipeline, I think, package is very important. Yeah, no. It's yeah. Right, right. Yeah. I'm not 